Good morning, church. Would you stand with us as we worship together? God, we commit this time to you as we've come in this place to meet with you, Lord. And so we give you this time as we begin a time of worship, as we dedicate our time and our heart and our thoughts to you now. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.
said your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. to shout your name, O oh Lord, and in your name, the morning breaks in glory, and in your name, creation sings your story. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. Jesus is our God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh
Father, we are people who have been found. Lord, who once was lost as sheep scattered, doing their own thing. Lord, you found us. You saved us. Can never fade away, reserved in heaven for us. Thank you for making us alive. We give you glory for that. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Why don't you turn and say hi to somebody new? So did you notice how I said say hi to somebody new? Was that a little difficult for you guys? Don't we all sit in the exact same spot every Sunday? How funny is that? If I come out for the first service and my mom's not sitting right there, I don't know what I would do. I'd panic. I'd probably have to call 911. The same seat every Sunday. It's great. Well, welcome, and if you're visiting us for the first time, we're glad that you're here. You know, I enjoyed waking up this morning and have it be a little overcast. I'm kind of a little bit done with the sun, but nonetheless, it was great. It's good to be here. It's good that the Dodgers are in first place again where they belong. Yeah, 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 that's right. Amen, right? 
But we have just a couple of quick announcements for you. First of all, the women are meeting tomorrow night, and they're going to be right here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. If, uh, ladies, if you haven't been to the women's study, it's a four-week study on the women who interacted with Jesus. Uh, this is week two coming up tomorrow. It's not important if you weren't here the following week. They're each independent studies of themselves, so you can be here tomorrow night at 7. If you need child care, not a problem. The ladies have that, and so that will be available for you as well. And then for those of you who don't know, on Wednesday nights, um, the last Wednesday of every month, we have something we call Together. It's a time where we come together as a church family. It starts at 6.30. We have dinner together. There's no cost to you. The dinner will be made. So you just show up with your family or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Come and join us. And we have a time of fellowship. Pastor Dave does a teaching. We have worship. We have uh, communion. And then this particular Wednesday, this week, we're going to have a baptism, too. So if you haven't been baptized and that's something that you really desire to do, uh, definitely bring your suit, and we're going to have it right out on the patio. We'll have the baptismal there. You guys will all be able to see it when you come. And we're really looking forward to a great time. So we hope that you'll be able to join us uh, this Wednesday night. Well, having said that, if the ushers will come forward, we'll go ahead and receive this morning's offering. Thank you. You are enough. You did it for. 
Again, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, enabling us to come directly to you, our Father, in prayer and worship. And Lord, now as we look into your word, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us, reveal your will to us this morning. We give you this time, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you today. I'm glad you could be with us. Jerry mentioned that this Wednesday night for Together, we're also having a baptism, and I just wanted to let you know also that we'll also do that at the Together in August, the last Wednesday in August. So if you want to be baptized but you're not able to make it this Wednesday, you could do it next month as well. A lot of people have asked me, well, how do I know if I should be baptized or not? I was baptized as a kid or or, you know, I was baptized before, but now I'm really, you know, walking with the Lord in a different way than I ever have. Do you think I should be baptized again? And uh, Baptism is a symbol of the new you that God has made. And, and so I think it's a beautiful way to testify of that. And if you're, if you're even thinking that, guys, so much has gone on since I was baptized before, a whole new change in my life, then I would encourage you to just do it again. It can't hurt. And, Unless the water's too cold, I don't think it will be. But uh, so I just encourage you to come out and and if you're not being baptized, still together is one of my favorite nights of every month. And uh, so come and enjoy the fellowship and celebrate with other people who are being baptized. And it's a great way, by the way, if you if you're going to be baptized, to invite people who don't know Jesus to come and see you baptized. They'll come for that and be able to you know, to experience being a part of of the body. So um, keep that in mind for sure. Now, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. We are looking at, again, in our series of Stuff Jesus Said. We've come to one this week, and it's primarily in verse 35 of John chapter 6, that I think is very familiar to people. And yet, in a lot of ways, I think that most people misunderstand what Jesus is trying to say here. I'm convinced that the truth of what Jesus is saying here is just vitally important. It may be one of the most important things that we look at this year in the teachings of Jesus, and, but it's easy to miss it. And, and I think, honestly, in reading different commentaries and hearing sermons on this passage, I think an awful lot of people missed the point that Jesus was trying to make. Let's look first at John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. One of the so-called I am statements of Jesus, where he used, he began with the term I am, and sometimes he just said that by itself. Other times, well, we say, die in your sins, but it's the personal name of God, and me, and there are several statements that Jesus makes explaining the, that he is the I am. 
But in this case, and he says, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, and here he says, I am the bread of life. Now, what most people do when they, when they see or they hear, oh, Jesus is the bread of life, the way they interpret this, and frankly, a lot of times the way it's taught, is in the same way that you, your body needs bread to constantly feed and to nourish it, so Jesus is that constant source of nourishment for you, so in the way that you eat food to nurture your body, you need to keep eating of Jesus to nurture your soul. But the truth is, that isn't really the point that Jesus was making. There's some truth to that, but let's take a look at the larger context and figure out what he was really saying by using the metaphor and saying, I am the bread of life. Well, the chapter starts in chapter six with the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And there were a bunch of people, 5,000 men, and so probably at least that many women and children, who were gathering around hearing Jesus preach. And it was getting late, and the disciples came to Jesus and said, you better break up the party because these people are gonna be hungry. Tell them to go home and get something to eat. And Jesus said, well, why don't you feed them? And they go, how could we do it? We can't afford to buy food for all these people. We certainly don't have all this food. Jesus said, well, what do we have? And there was a, a kid that had five loaves and two fishes. He brought it forward. Jesus took it, and he began to break off the bread and to break off these little fishes. And, and those loaves of bread weren't like big loaves of bread. They were like a little roll. And as he broke it off, miraculously, the, the food began to be magnified, and all the people who were there, including the disciples, ate until they were satisfied. And as they gathered up the leftovers, there were 12 baskets left over. Now that's a cool miracle. That's one, if I could go back and, and be a part of one, other than the eating fish part, I would, it'd be like, whoa, I would love to see that. That would be amazing. And it made an impression on the people. Now, as you read through chapter six, Jesus then left that area and went back across the Galilee to the area of Capernaum down at the south end of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, the disciples took a boat, Jesus walked on the water. And so they get there and all these people were looking for him. They, all, all these people who enjoyed this free meal we're now becoming stalkers trying to find Jesus. And they finally caught up to him in, in uh, Capernaum. Now look at, after they catch him, in verse 25 of chapter six, they found him on the other side of the sea and they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? They're acting like, oh, they just ran into him again. It was ridiculous. They were following him all that way, stalking him, and then when they run into him, it's like, oh, fancy meeting you here. But look what Jesus said in verse 26. He said, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. So he told them, your problem is, you just like free food. And you're coming after me, not because, oh, my, my soul is starved. You're coming to me because you want more free food. And now he continues, well, and they said, after he laid that on them about, you know, not laboring for food that perishes, but food that endures to everlasting life. They said to him in verse 28, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? So they're like, okay, if you're not gonna do another miracle and give us food, show us how to do that. Show us how to do your work. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, okay, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? They're like, okay, do a miracle so we'll get what you're saying. So we'll understand what you're shooting at. And then they had a suggestion in verse 31. They go, for instance, if you want to do a miracle, 
Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're like, so can you do a miracle? Like that has to do with more food? And kind of like, you know, back in the, when Moses and the children of Israel were in the wilderness and God gave them bread every day and they just went out and gathered it and, and they go, how about something like that? In fact, we don't even need you anymore if you'll just start making food show up for us every day. Jesus said to them, verse 32, most assuredly I say to you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so verse 34, they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They're still looking for a perennial meal ticket. They're still looking for an opportunity to always know that they're gonna have something good to eat. That's where their head is at. Now, as you continue through the passage, after he said that he's the bread of life and that if you eat of him, you'll never hunger and you'll never thirst if you believe in him. And, and so then he's going on and explaining that he's the only one that's seen God. And if you look down in verse 47, see, at this point the Jews have been questioning him, what are you talking about? You're the bread that comes down from heaven in verse 41. Now in verse 47, he says, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. And then again, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then he goes on to say in verse 53, I'm telling you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now we know from our perspective that he was referring to receiving him and participating in communion as a symbol of that receiving of him. And so, you know, they freaked out. John explains he was, Jesus later said, these are spirit and life. I'm not talking about actually eating, being a cannibal. But most of the people who, thousands of people who were following him at this point bailed. And they just go, you know what? He's talking about eating his body and drinking his blood. We're out of here. We're not hanging with that. Only 12 disciples were left out of all that. And Jesus said, you guys aren't leaving too? And, and Peter said, well, <laughs> it's not because we get this, but we don't have any other place to go because you have the words of eternal life and we believe that you're the Messiah. So the whole thing, I mean, he, he takes it from manna in the wilderness to food being multiplied for these people flows on through and goes, it's me, I am the bread, and then taking us through his whole sacrifice for us, and if we participate in him, then we can have life forever. So, in laying all this out, I think that we make a mistake when we say, how much is Jesus like bread? Because he says, I am the bread. So bread is nutritious, and bread is something that you need regularly, and bread just adds something to every meal, and, and it's awesome, and so that's what Jesus is. Because when we read through this, Jesus is more making a point that he isn't like regular bread than that he is. And one of the things that he drives home is, I am not like manna. Where you eat of me, you need to eat of me again and again and again, and then you die. He goes, there's something different about me. Because the truth is, when you eat of me once, you'll live forever. You're not going to need more. You're not going to need extra. You're not going to try to find you know, how to then keep refilling yourself with bread. The difference in me, and, and there in... Um, like in verses 50 and 51, where he says, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Eat of it, you won't die. 
The, the verb there is used in what's called in the Greek the aorist tense. Now, you don't need to know a bunch of Greek to understand this. The Greeks have different tenses of Greek. Now, in English, tenses refer to time. Past tense, future tense, present tense refers to when it's happening. But in the Greek, tenses refer to the kind of action. And the present tense in the Greek means that something is going on continually and regularly. Um, the, the aorist tense is referring to a punctiliar action, a point of action, a single action. And some people even say that the aorist is the past tense in Greek, but that's not technically correct. But what's technically correct is what he is saying is you eat and you won't die. You eat and you won't hunger. And that is seen as a, as a singular event. Now that's hugely different than bread as we know it. And you know, the truth is, Jesus, said, by the way, used the same thing in the same verb tense, in the aorist tense, when he talked to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter four. Remember that? He goes, she's coming out there to gather water, and he said, I can give you water that when you drink it, you'll never thirst again. You drink it once, you'll never thirst. And she was like, man, give me that. Because for me to drink water, I gotta work hard. I have to w hike out here to the well and draw it and pull it up and take it back. And if I could just never thirst again, that would be great. But ask yourself, if today we had a little cake and it was out there at the coffee table, and if, you, if I told you if you ate that cake, you will never need to eat again, would you eat the cake? I mean, would you go, that would be awesome to never want to eat again. And I, I know for me, I'd really have to wrestle with that because on the one hand, yeah, I never have to eat again. Boy, I could save so much time. I could save so much money. It might be cool. But then I start thinking, that pizza at Pyology is like unbelievable. And I, and I love, last night my wife made some street tacos and oh, they were so good. To never do that, I'm not even buying into if I could drink something, I would never drink again. Because sometimes just a nice, cool bottle of water feels really good. I like it. And so I'm not even sure that, when physically speaking, what we would like to, to have is all of our desire and all of our enjoyment just go away. But I think sometimes spiritually that mentality transfers over as well. And so, as we are addicted to, and essentially we are various elements of gluttony, you know, utilized in different ways. That's kind of how we, we don't just eat to live, most of us. If you do it so you can lose weight, and then you can start eating the way you really want to eat. We're, we went to the fair this week. Oh man, unbelievable, all the food choices. And it was good. And after I finished eating, I thought, I'm never going to eat again. <laughs> but I'm already thinking, how long is the fair here? Because, man, I could use one more of those cinnamon rolls. They have them. It's inside one of the tents with a bunch of products that you don't care about. But back there in the corner, these amazing cinnamon rolls. And if somebody told me, you'll never want one of those again, I don't know, man. I, they're cool. We were in the green room with the worship band. We were talking this morning about fair food, and everyone's like, yeah, I, the one I should have got was the bacon-wrapped deep-fried pickle. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I missed that one, but I'm not really craving it. But Jerry's going, yeah, but they had a deep-fried jalapeno stuffed with cream cheese. That probably would have been good. And I'm like, hmm, when's the fair <laughs> close? Because that's the way we look at things. We, that's what we expect. But in the worship band, somebody came up with the idea that what, what they should really make is a bacon-wrapped, chocolate-covered, sugar-filled insulin, deep-fried. <laughs> and then you eat it, and it's like, well, it didn't even affect me. So I don't know, I'm thinking about inventing that, getting a patent on it. But bread, we love bread. And we want to keep taking it. And what does this have to do with Jesus? Well, what Jesus says is, when you have me, you can be satisfied. 
In fact, I am all you need. And he drives this home repeatedly, and that's what he's really trying to say here is, unlike bread, which you eat it, and the next day you want more. And you want it, and then you want more. He goes, I'm not like that. And I am not, I don't cater to spiritual gluttony. That when you have me, you have me completely. Um, Paul talked about, in, over in Colossians chapter two, he was talking about Jesus as being God. And he made the statement, as strong as you could say, that Jesus is completely, totally God. He said, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. That word fullness, pleroma, it means the total package. And he goes, everything that there is to God is totally in Jesus. And you might go, so what? Well, the very next verse, he says, and in him you have been made complete. Root from the same word, play Roma, the total package. So what Paul is saying is, all all that God is is in Jesus, and all that Jesus is is yours. Now, that radically affects us. And yet, I think so often, even in the Christian world, we treat Jesus as if he's just like fair food, And so what happens is we always think we need more. And we have worship songs talking about, oh, I want more and more and more of Jesus. And then we live our Christian lives as if we've got to find a deeper experience. We've got to get more. Oh, you know, oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, but what you really need is this experience. What you really need is to go to this seminar. What you really need is to understand this. Or you need more knowledge in order to really make you complete. You only have part of the package. Every false cult that's out there operates on the assumption that, well, yeah, you have Jesus, but there's more. There's more that you can get. And so it feeds on experiences that are, that are spiritually gluttonous, ultimately. That are, it doesn't add anything to Jesus, but it can create that desire that you always want to come back and get more. It's why, you know, in some churches where they really get into the whole experience of things, they, it starts out with, well, you know, you have Jesus, but, oh, man, you really need more of the Spirit. So they're like, okay, how do I do that? And then they're going, well, you need to practice this activity. You need to do this. And, and what happens eventually is, okay, I want to feel. Somebody told me that they had an experience where they felt like cotton candy all over them. And then I go, I want that cotton candy feeling. And I meet somebody else who goes, I actually felt electricity pulse through. Or, you know, I heard God talk to me. Or angels showed up in my bedroom and were talking to me. And I'm like, ooh, I need that. I want that. I want to add that. And then what's, what deteriorated in certain parts of the church is um, laughing in the spirit, where people are just laying on the floor, cackling, you know, in a silly sort of way that, you know, that's what it is. But that doesn't satisfy you either. So you also need a little barking in the spirit. And so people are, woof, 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 woof. And l- last week I was in a museum with Greg Laurie, and he, I hear a dog barking. And they're like looking all over for the dog and then they found a door that was open and there was a dog outside. Okay, I found him, I found him. And they closed the door and (laughs) it was Greg. But he has this great barking sound. But that's what the church starts like. I need something else. Ooh, if I could have Jesus and only do that. Now it's easy for us to look at the charismaniac movement and go, yep, that's the way they are but let me get a little closer to home for some of us. Sometimes I think we feel if I learn more and more, if I know the Bible better and better, or if I know how to defend my faith, if I can argue effectively, or if I can get you know, this greater sense of understanding about something, if I am a great Bible scholar, then that is certainly going to be more. But How's that working for you? Now, if Jesus is everything we need, then accepting Jesus should be the most important thing, the most monumental thing we do in our lives, right? So what do we do as Christians 
if you look at the statistics that I've seen, like 80 to 90% of people who have accepted Jesus Christ, the person that witnessed to them had been a Christian for less than two years. So are we more effective in bringing people to Jesus when we are new Christians than when we stuff our heads full of knowledge and somehow we are gorging in a, in a spiritually gluttonous way rather than just taking the simple message that when I found Jesus, I found everything that I needed and now I want to share that with you. I remember many years ago, there was a little gal who was a brand new Christian. She'd been a Christian like two weeks and she was out street witnessing. And she, as she was sharing with people, um, there was a guy that came up and he was really arguing with her a lot. He was a professor at UCI. And he was just turning her in knots and she was crying and she just kept saying, saying, I don't know anything about that, but I know that Jesus loves you. I know that you need him. And finally, she just left feeling like she had failed completely. And a few days later, that professor came over to Calvary Chapel and asked to speak to the pastor. And when Chuck came out and talked to him, and he goes, you know, how can I help you? He said, there was some girl from your church who was trying to talk to me on the streets, and he said, I was really rude to her, and she was so loving back. And he said, but you know what? I realize I need what she has. How do I get that? You know, if you had spent another 10 years studying philosophy, you wouldn't win a guy like that over. But sometimes we think, oh, I just need, okay, I have Jesus, but man, I need a bunch of other stuff. And we end up treating him like, like a piece of bread. And we're, we need to decorate it. We need to do other things with it. We joke about that, talking about manna, that they must have had a million different recipes of how to use manna. We sometimes do the same thing in the way that we live our lives. Now, when I think of the bread of life, you know, I mean, I like bread. I try to stay away from it most of the time. But the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of the bread of life is a hostess Twinkie. <laughs> Praise God, they're, they're making them again. And I, I talked about them in first service, but I went to a few stores and I couldn't find them, so I don't know where they have them. But they have them somewhere because the lady brought one up to me for, you know, after first service. It's like the perfect food because you can eat it, but you don't really get full, and you always can eat another one. I mean, honestly, when I went looking for them, I was hoping to get a whole box because I could use one each service and then something, you know, I couldn't, they couldn't go to waste. Plus, they're great. They're sealed up. Their shelf life is like, like a nuclear half-life of a bomb. <laughs> and so it's really good. And there are some of you right now that are going, really? They're selling Twinkies again? Where can I get one of those? But the Twinkie, look at it. I don't know what I'm gonna do third service. If somebody has a Twinkie in your car, bring it to me. There it is. That's your Twinkie. And if you live your life, <laughs> if you live your life always like looking for Twinkies, and you translate that into the spiritual world, Jesus would just go, are you kidding me? You have me. Now what else do you really need? What else could you really have that could add to the fact that you have me? And we talk about saying, yes, you know, there are songs that Jesus is all I need. But is that the way we live our lives, really? Is that the impression that people would get from us? Because the truth is, for most of us, I go, yeah, I need Jesus and I have him, but I need a bunch of other stuff too. Not only that, I have Jesus, but somehow I feel like it's not enough. I need another experience, I need a deeper understanding, I need to you know, have more power, I, whatever it is that I go, the truth is, Jesus isn't enough for me. Now how do you know when Jesus really is enough for you? Well, by the way, it's not to say that experiences aren't good, 
that it's not to say that you can't come into a deeper understanding of what you have. That's very important. But what in your life, if you lost it, would you really feel a sense of loss? And that's where the rubber meets the road, ultimately. Because if I, if I say, Jesus is all I need, but I like my car, and then my car gets wrecked, I would be like, wait, I, I don't want to lose my car. And what's that telling me? I needed Jesus and my car or and my house, or and my everything else, or Jesus plus a Twinkie, I'm good. And he's going, how about just me? Can you ever come to an awareness or an understanding that when you trusted in Jesus, that you were finished with everything that you need? Now, there are things you, you still may need, food or medicine and things like that, But what will happen if you don't have it? You will one day see Jesus because you're like, I'm starving, I'm starving. Oh good, you're getting close. That's a good thing. Jesus, when he was in the wilderness being tempted, he spent 40 days without physical food, but it didn't affect his ability to spiritually function in an absolutely unbelievable way. And so for us, I think looking at our lives, we first have to say, is my spiritual life something that I'm always trying to get more and I'm always lacking and I feel like, oh, I'm so hungry for more spiritual experience. If so, that may not be really hunger. That's not a need. That may just be gluttony. But more than that, what is it that I think I need in addition to him? There are things that he calls us to do that we don't want to do because it costs too much or it inconveniences us too much or it takes too much of our time. So really, you're going to have God, you know that God wants you to do something, but you can't afford it. Like he tells you to give, but you're like, well, sorry, I, 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 there were other things I needed. See, if we need only him, then that's our basis. And let's face it, for someone to tell us that we are set for eternity, what more? What, what more can you even add to that? What is it that you can, that you can supplement that with that's going to make eternity better? Well, there's only one thing I know of that makes eternity better, and that is to bring people that you love there with you. And if you understand that when you accepted Jesus Christ, then you had everything that you need. Now that's gonna translate into wanting other people to accept him. If you can go through your life and not be burdened by people who are, who are dying without Jesus, I mean, this is a matter of heaven and hell. This is a matter of life and death. My priorities will become skewed if I forget that. And I'm afraid to speak out for Jesus because here I have the one that is supposed to satisfy me, but the truth is I'm not very satisfied a lot of times, so I'm kind of apologetic about telling somebody that they can be satisfied too when I'm not. So our full-time job really as followers of Jesus is to wake up every day and find a way to be satisfied in Jesus. If we believe, if you don't believe that Jesus is all you need, then you don't believe in Jesus at all because that's what he says. So to, to start every day by just going, okay, Jesus, you are all I need. So today is a win. Whatever happens, whatever I gain, whatever I lose, whatever I accomplish, whatever I don't, I have you and it's already a great day. It's already the perfect day. Now, whatever else I do, the pressure's off but what is it that's going to matter to me the most? If I am someone who was starving to death and I found food that will, I think the Twinkies attracted a fly. <laughs> if, I, if I found something that gave me everything that I needed, am I gonna wanna share that with people I care about? Absolutely, but that's, that's a radical change. And I'll tell you something, if we have no desire and no burden to tell people 
how they can accept Jesus, then how can we say that we've come to determine that that is the most important thing in the world? If you've told people about a restaurant that you like, oh, you ought to go there. And I know, you know, there are some of you when I mentioned pyology, you're like, what, what? Pyology, what's that? That sounds great. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> but I'm not, and I'll tell you about pyology. It's a restaurant over in the Spe- Irvine Spectrum that, that makes your pizza there. You pick all the stuff and you put it on, and it's a great deal, and it's just amazing. The people that own the store are Christians, too. So, um, But if I'm going to tell you about pyology, and I'm not going to tell you about Jesus, then it says what I need is pyology first, and yeah, someday I hope you come to, to meet Jesus and understand him, but right now, pizza is more important than that. And right now, some of you are thinking about pizza, like, hmm, whoa, which, which, part of the, which part of the spectrum? I don't want to walk too far <laughs> to get there. But Jesus says, I am different than that. You have me and you have everything. Corey Ten Boom made the statement, you'll never learn that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Some of us have gone through experiences where we've lost a lot of things that we thought we needed. And it's Jesus' intention through all of that to go, you still have me. I'm still with you. The truth is, you didn't need what you thought you needed. All you needed was me. And so when you lose friends or you move away and you lose your church or whatever, he's going, you feel a sense of loss? Okay, I get that. Just like you feel like you want to eat after church today. But understand this. You have what you need in me. People will be attracted to those who have found something that has made them satisfied. People aren't attracted to others who are saying, you know, yeah, believe me, I need as much as you do. Yep, we can exchange stories about how much we need. People are attracted to Jesus when they realize there's someone I can know, and when I accept him, I will never really have a substantial need again. You can still want. You can still experience, but your needs are taken care of because your greatest need is to have your soul taken care of for eternity, and he does that for you. And I think for every one of us, we have to ask ourselves, how much of my life am I spending focusing on things I think I need that I really don't? And how much of my spiritual life looks like somebody who's like starving for food after their last meal? How much am I thinking, what I need to do is get a lot smarter, fill my mind with with lots of Bible studies every day, every night, just gorging on, on content and being less effective than ever at telling people how to find Jesus. Sometimes the more you study, the more confused you get. And you want to try to share with somebody about Jesus and you're like, yeah, now I know you're probably wondering about this problem and about evolution and how a whale could swallow a guy and how could, and so I've got all these and they just like lose interest. No, it's real simple. You can find Jesus and when you trust him, you'll have everything you ever need. How much do you need to know in order to do that? And I mean, I love studying the Bible. But I'll be honest with you, I I know that some of you, if I ask you three weeks from now, so what did I teach on in John chapter six, verse 35? A lot of you will have no idea. You can look it up and maybe you'll remember something. But I'll tell you something even more shocking. There are times when somebody says to me on Wednesday, wow, your message Sunday was life-changing for me. And I'm like, what did I teach on on Wednesday? (laughs) I don't even remember. But remember this, it's all about Jesus. Jesus is everything. And the simplicity of our spiritual life is that you have Jesus, you're set. If you want other things, that gaining them or losing them has no relationship to whether you have what you need because you don't need anything except him. And anytime you fool yourself into thinking that you need other things, 
you're missing out, you're selling out who he is and what he wants to be in your life. This is a reminder for all of us. Now, whatever I teach on Sundays, um, I always make sure. I, some of my messages are decent, some of them are really bad and whatever, but one thing you can bank on, every, and it's one reason why we encourage people to bring others to church, because every Sunday I'm gonna tell people how they can find Jesus. Because the truth is, like Paul who said, I just preached Christ and him crucified. Brilliant man, could have given great theological discourses, but he's like, no, I'm just preaching Jesus. Jesus is the bottom line of everything that we do. Jesus is the only thing really lasting and impacting I can share with anyone. And so I always wind up a message like I am this one by saying, if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't trusted in him, whatever you think you need, whatever needs are filling your life or how many Twinkies you're taking in to try to satisfy who you are, whether it's through success or friends, relationships or um, experiences or philosophies or anything like that, I have to tell you, none of those things will ever satisfy you. The only thing that will really take care of you to where you can go, I have everything I need, is Jesus Christ. And he died for you so that your sins can be forgiven and you can enter into a relationship with him. And when you accept him, when you eat of him, as he says, you'll have everything that you need. You will have everything you need to be satisfied. Now, you won't automatically be satisfied. You won't feel satisfied. There are people all around you right now that accepted Jesus Christ 50 years ago, and they're still complaining all the time, and they're still not satisfied with anything in their life, but they could be satisfied because they'll have everything that they need, and you can have everything that you need to form the basis for satisfaction in your life when you come to understand that Jesus really is all we need. He's not like food that you just have to keep eating and passing it through and you need some more. He is the one who gives us a reason to be satisfied. And if we aren't satisfied with him, it's because we just have too many other things we're trying to accomplish. Let's let go of all that. And for you, today, your life can start over and you can have the only thing that you really have needed. Now, I know you've been living your life thinking you needed a bunch of other stuff, working really hard, sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't, but you're never satisfied. What you really need is Jesus, and you can meet him today. All you have to do is ask him, and your life will start over today. There'll be people down here in the front, they love praying for you for any reason, but especially if you need to get right with Jesus. You can get all you need this morning. And I pray that you'll come down and just give your life to Jesus. Trust him. And then the rest of your life won't be trying to get stuff that you need. The rest of your life will be reminding yourself constantly that you already have what you need. Being satisfied, satiated by just knowing him and having him. Let's pray. God, we're really so sorry when we keep wanting Twinkies spiritually and materially and really all we need is what we already have in you. There are some people here today who probably don't have you. Please help them to know that their whole life can change right now by getting the one thing, the person that they really need in their life and that's you and you'll never leave us, and nothing can separate us from your love. I thank you for that. So draw them to yourself by your spirit. Help them to find their satisfaction in you. Lord, for all of us who keep thinking we need more than you, remind us today to be satisfied because we have you because you are all we need. You are our bread of life that when we eat it once, we're set for eternity. Help us to learn to be satisfied in you. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's all stand. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you.